you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Nela Haltemann. I am an associate science editor for The Scientist, and I will be moderating our discussion. Today, our speakers, Drs. Ski, Chilton, and Tom Bumal, will tell us how they combined metabolomics, transcriptomics, and immune profiling to study SARS-CoV-2's ability to attack multiple organs, even after the virus has been cleared from the body. We really like for our webinars to be interactive. We encourage you to send us your questions or comments at any point during the webinar, and Drs. Chilton and Bumal will address these during the Q&A session following the presentations. To ask a question, you can simply click on the Q&A tab and type your query into the question box located on the right side of your screen. Today's webinar will be archived on the website of The Scientist, and we will send you the link via email within a couple of days. Please do note that you will not be able to download the presentation slides. Now, before we start, I would like to thank our webinar sponsor. Cayman Chemical draws from more than 40 years of research and manufacturing experience to develop tools to support coronavirus research. This includes screening libraries for drug discovery and tools to study latent infection, host immune responses, and post viral syndromes. Cayman also offers contract services such as immunopeptidome profiling, structured based um, drug design, lipidomics, and biomarker development to support drug discovery research. Our sponsor has provided us with some helpful resources related to today's webinar, and we have posted these in our handout section, which you can see on the right side of your screen. You can access and download these documents at any time during today's webinar. And with that, let me introduce our first speaker for today. Dr. Ski Chilton is a professor in the School of Nutritional Sciences and Wellness, and the director of the Precision Nutrition and Wellness Initiative at the University of Arizona. Dr. Chilton wears many different hats. He is an academic professor, an entrepreneur, inventor, and author. For over 40 years, he has studied the interaction between nutrition, biochemistry, and genetics, particularly as it relates to lipid signaling. Dr. Chilton's work on nutrition in the context of genomic variation has helped pioneer the areas of personalized or precision nutrition and the impact of gene diet interactions on human health and disease disparities. Now let's make sure that um, your slides are up and running. That looks great on my end. And with that, well, thank you. Yeah, go thank ahead. you. Thank you so much for that nice introduction. I, I, I do appreciate it. Um, I understand that today's uh, talk is about COVID's long game, but I'm going to start out uh, with, with work that we've done on acute COVID itself, the short game. And I think as we go through the talk, you'll see how the acute um, uh, pathobiology then may very well lead to, to the long game. So. We began this work um, uh, about a year and a half ago. We, we took many of the resources where we were working on gene diet interactions, metabolomics and lipidomics. And we really began to focus in particular lipidomically on acute COVID with samples uh, out of Stony Brook in, in New York and, and initially received uh, around 350 plasma samples and, and, and then uh, a, a secondary cohort from also New York and, and Banner Hospital here in, in Tucson. So uh, here we go. So we were interested in the pathobiology leading in particular to COVID mortality and uh, as you'll see, uh, we started out with uh, non-COVID patients, mild patients, severe patients, and patients who had died from the disease. And again, these were plasma uh, patients. And in particular, we were focused on what in the severe patients uh, was leading to death, what, what was most associated with death. And, 
what was most associated from moving for protective immunity uh, to immune uh, dysregulation. Now, as I said in the beginning, um, the timeline of post-acute, as you can see here from this Nature Medicine paper, uh, uh, takes place uh, really from about four weeks on. And, 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 and I, I, I want to emphasize that I think what we have learned from acute uh, COVID and the pathobiology may help lead us to a better understanding of the pathobiology of post-acute COVID. And, and, and I'll get to that at the end, but before I do, I, I want to look at acute COVID and what we discovered there. I'm always reminded, uh, I, I have a mentor and he, he's back at Wake Forest and his name is Cash McCall, Charles McCall. And he always reminds me that any infectious disease uh, is this balance between disease resistance, our ability to fight the disease as a human and, and, and host tolerance, what we can withstand from the disease resistance. So, you know, if disease resistance for a disease such as uh, COVID is, is, is not strong enough, then, then it leads to death. If the host tolerance, uh, it cannot tolerate uh, the disease resistant response, well, that leads to death. So what we're looking at in any of these diseases is this balance between disease resistance and host tolerance. And it's typically in this disease, it's a, a, a hyper inflammatory or a hypercoagulation response. Uh, that's coming and and it, it it crashes with you and 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 leads to death. So just to kind of say this in another way, and, and this is a a figure that Dr. McCall and I drew, and the idea is that you have quite often this initial immune. Uh, host defense response. And in this case, we see a, a, the, the cytokine, the inflammatory storm is a highly energetic response. And quite often, uh, in, 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 or in some cases, uh, in people who get really sick or die, it's followed by a much longer uh, post-inflammatory or coagulation response. Uh, uh, this is a low energy response, organs running out of energy. You typically have repressed immunity during this. And, and, and again, if you move above the dotted line, you don't survive. Then you see at the end, long COVID. Now, as we were choosing patients from the two co cohorts that we looked at, we, we chose mild patients, stage one here. Um, we chose uh, uh, moderate patients, which were in 2B, uh, uh, pneumonia or hypoxia, and then uh, stage three, those who died of hard shock, septic shock and, and multiple organ failure. So, so those are the, the, the stages of the disease that we chose within our cohorts. Now, this is just to remind everyone that once COVID leaves the lung, uh, it, it goes everywhere and it, it does really nasty things in, in all the organ systems and, and ultimately leads to, to, to multiple organ failure. So, and, and I won't read all of these, but just to show them here. So we chose uh, metabolomics with a focus on lipidomics. Uh, as most of you uh, know that uh, we choose these omics and, and we like lipidomics uh, 
Uh, I tell people I'll forget my wife where my car is parked, but I won't forget the 400 biochemical steps that metabolize lipids. So we like lipids because we know them and I'm old. And so we know the pathways and we know that, you know, there are about 3000 commonly used metabolites in, in most of these pathways. We know they sit right next to the clinical phenotype. We know that the output is the output of gene environment interactions and, and can reflect the impact of, of epigenetics and the environment. So, so for us, this, this is an important stage to look at disease and, and to de trajectory of disease. Now, as I said, we initially got our samples out of Stony Brook. We had almost 400 samples. Uh, from our colleagues there. Um, uh, our data scientists then were able to pull out 127. This was a very chaotic sampling, as you might imagine, in which the sampling was uniform enough that we could make sense uh, uh, of the phenotypes that we were looking at. So this was the demographic and the clinical characteristics uh, of our, our, our patient population. Uh, age, not unexpected, was uh, statistically significant. Um, again, there wasn't a great deal of racial diversity in this group of folks uh, coming out uh, of, of uh, Long Island, New York. Uh, uh, again, uh, you can see uh, BMI actually going in a direction that we probably would not have anticipated, but uh, you can certainly read the characteristics of this patient population. So what we were really focused on here is we were really focused on the severe and the patients who died. Uh, and what were the patterns, what were the molecular patterns that were different uh, between those who were severe and those who succumbed to the disease. And to kind of make a long story short and not go through all this data, but just to show you the data, basically we found two patterns that were different. Uh, one uh, was uh, around short chain acylcarnitines or acetylcarnitines, uh, indicators of mitochondrial dysfunction. And, and, and what became apparent uh, in our lipidomics was these acylcarnitines, and in particular acetylcarnitine, uh, was much higher in those individuals who died. Again, a marker of mitochondrial dysfunction. And it certainly has been seen in septic shock in a multi-center trial, so not so surprising. The second thing that we saw, though, was somewhat, well, it was surprising. We saw lots of lysophospholipids. And in particular, we saw lot, lots of lysophosphatidylethanolamine, lots of lysophosphatidylserine, not an increase in lysophosphatidylcholine, and we saw oleic acid and linoleic acid. Well, that very, very much felt like, um, for those of us who've studied this, that felt like a secretory PLA2. Uh, again, the, the, the focus on PE and PS and some PI and, and linoleic acid and oleic acid. So, um, so we began to pay attention to that. Now, this was the increase in, in plasma acetylcarnitines, again, a, a marker of mitochondrial dysfunction and also mitochondrial DNA. And, and, and again, very strong markers of, of death. That This is the last time I'll mention this distinct pattern. The, the pattern of the phospholipase is, uh, as, as, as you know, uh, phospholipase A2 cleaves the SN2 position of glycerol phospholipids. Uh, depending on the phospholipase A2, it can cleave a whole variety of unsaturated uh, fatty acids, some very specific for arachidonate, others specific for linolo 
linoleate and oleate and some specific for the PC or PE and PS. So, so what it very much looked like, or at least what the lipidomic was telling us, or, or certainly providing evidence for, was that there were, was a, a PLA2 or something appeared to be releasing large amount of lysophospholipids and large amounts of oleic and linoleic acid. So, so uh, again, uh, we remembered secretory PLA2s. I just show here on the left the PLA2, but on the right the family of secretory uh, PLA2s. Uh, you can see the important ones are there are many important ones, but the most published on are in circles. Uh, the 2A, which is the synovial, the platelet, the 2A, uh, the 5 and the 10 uh, have all uh, been published on in, in several diseases. Now, again, I'm going to come back to this in, in a second, but uh, these have a great deal of sequence homology with the um, the uh, PLA2s found in snake venoms, and uh, and that becomes an important issue as, as we go along. And like I said, uh, if we compare mammalian and snake venom uh, PLA2s, uh, common ancestor, uh, um, the group two mammalian. Uh, similar to group two viper, uh, like the rattlesnakes we find here in, in, in Arizona. And then there's uh, hydrolytically active uh, forms of that PLA2 in the snakes. And then there are forms that, that work through non-enzymatic mechanisms based on uh, membrane receptors and their ability to disrupt membrane permeability. Again, the Group 1 PLA2s uh, are, are similar to the pancreatic and found in the old world snakes uh, uh, like uh, coral, cobra, and, and mambas, to mention a few. So why do we have these? Why would we have kept these? Uh, um, well, because these PLA2s recognize phosphatidylserine, phosphatidylethanolamine, uh, because they recognize the outsides, particularly of gram-positive bacteria, uh, they do a very, very good job of hydrolyzing those membranes. As uh, as had was when this was covered by the press, our, our paper. It, it, the word shredder kept coming up, but again, it shreds the membranes uh, uh, of bacteria. We don't know so much in viruses, but, but uh, we know that if you're in the middle, you're in a protective physiological levels and, and you've got pathogen resolution and, and host tolerance. Uh, excessive levels, uh, you have the pathobiological effects, inflammation, uh, these have the ability to disrupt surfactant, vascular damage. And when cells begin to undergo apoptosis or necrosis or any of the osis uh, and lose their ability to maintain their membrane asymmetry with phosphatidylcholine to the outside, that exposes these organs and it exposes the PS and the PE and the PI um, to these, and, and at that point, uh, these have a powerful ability uh, to lead to multiple organ failure by shredding those membranes. So it does all of that, certainly bacterial hydrolysis or lysis, uh, but it also uh, has the ability, if it sees free mitochondria, it certainly understands that the membranes of those mitochondria have a bacterial background, have a bacterial progeny, uh, progeny so it, it recognizes those. And so any extracellular mitochondria, it will hydrolyze, release mitochondrial DNA, other damps. Uh, 
um, and uh, uh, microparticle extracellular vesicles, leukocytes, again, uh, utilizing the fatty acids uh, uh, coming out of these, it certainly has the, the potential to enhance inflammation and amplification of the inflammatory response. So it was a bit ironic that this came back to us. Uh, I published a paper in the Journal of Clinical Investigation in 1996, and they asked me to write an editorial about this enzyme, and, and I said, it does so many things. Um, I really don't know what its its true role is. And I, the name of the paper was, Will the True Role of Secretory PLA-2 Stand Up? And in many ways, I left the field at that point uh, for others to try to figure that out. Uh, little did I know that it would visit us again 20-some years later. Once we saw that PE and PS seemed to be going up in our untargeted assay, we developed targeted assays for lysolipids, and you can see the PE was increasing in those who deceased, uh, uh, not so much, not at all in PC, and, and some in PS. Well, the next thing that we did was uh, we, we did buy, uh, and this is not a shameless plug, but we, we bought Cayman's ELISA kit uh, for the group 2A SPLA2, and began to measure SPLA2 levels uh, in, in the patients. And as you can see on the top here, those patients uh, who were dying uh, had um, a much higher proportion of those with much higher levels. We then measured the enzymatic activity of this and, and levels uh, correlated closely with uh, with uh, enzymatic activity on the right here. You can see on the very left of the right, the SPLA2 levels uh, in deceased, severe and mild. And then you can see a lot of the clinical parameters that do not bode well. And in fact, um, are highly associated with death uh, in these patients. And SPLA2 levels were associated with them as well. At that point, one of the reasons I moved uh, to the University of Arizona was the incredible data scientists that were here. Um, and so uh, teamed up with some of the data scientists here and, and really looking at this and looking at the multidimensional uh, data that we were getting. We had 81 clinical endpoints. We had all of this lipidomics. We had this SPLA2 and so, we put it through three machine learning algorithms. The first was a clinical decision tree. Again, these are completely unbiased to run thousands of times and much to our surprise uh, in, in, that following whether or not you were severe or mild, the next predictor even among the 81 clinical parameters, many well known was whether or not SPLA2 levels were above 10 nanograms per mil. Uh, that increased in the disease cohort, uh, increased the disease cohort up to 63%. If you then added to that blood urinary nitrogen, uh, uh, a marker of kidney dysfunction, you further, uh, um, enrich the deceased population up to 76%. Once again, we were very surprised uh, by this, this finding um, given uh, the indices that we were feeding the system. Once again, uh, a second uh, analysis, machine learning analysis, uh, um, uh, utilizing 80 clinical indices, uh, in a random forest uh, assembly of decision trees, you know, a thousand decision trees were generated, randomly selecting subsets of patients and features uh, to arrive at the final model. And as you can see in the final model, SPLA2 and BON uh, were the two highest uh, parameters in terms of feature importance among all of this multi-dimensional data. Well, 
the the um, reviewers and editors at the Journal of Clinical Investigation rightfully ask for a second independent cohort. We gathered a second cohort, predominantly of patients here in Arizona at Banner, but also enriching with samples from New York. And, and once again, uh, we were able, if you look in that this right-hand corner, you can see the enrichment of the deceased patients uh, uh, as a function of SPLA2 levels and bond levels. We then have since teamed up with Somalogic and we've been able to, to get our hands on, uh, on uh, several cohorts, to look at several cohorts. Uh, and, uh, and in particular, we wanted to look at the family of secretory PLA2s. Uh, and this just shows uh, a data set from those who survived and succumbed to the disease and the statistical significance of that with 4,776 unique proteins. And you can see the group 2A, the group 10, and the group 5, certainly the most well-known were highly statistically significant. So I, I think I showed in an earlier slide, what is this doing in the vasculature? What is it doing in, in the organ? Certainly as cells are dying, as they're perturbed, as they're no longer able to maintain membrane asymmetry, uh, they're flipping those membranes. SPLA2 recognizes those membranes. They're disrupting mitochondria. Um, they're uh, being utilized by activated lymphocyte, leukocytes and extracellular vesicles, all producing eicosanoids and lysolipids and damps and, and uh, cytokines, um, which are a feedback loop uh, uh, to continue the inflammatory response. So in our model, we think PLA2 and secretory PLA2 plays a role. We think higher levels of that uh, uh, reduces uh, uh, survival fitness and, uh, and, and, and leads to death. And that's certainly what our, our, our data uh, is telling us. Uh, again, as the reviewers uh, so accurately said, uh, how do you know it's causing as opposed to a bystander? Um, studies in the mid-1980s and, and early 1990s showed that circulating levels of SPLA2, if it continued to go up in, in patients with sepsis or septic shock, these people would die. Uh, if it began to clear itself, they would live. We've begun to look at that. Uh, we've just looked at the publicly available data from the mass uh, General Hospital study that was published uh, uh, in uh, cell reports. Uh, this was uh, patients who died, ventilated, survived, hospitalized uh, in different demographics. And basically, in this very preliminary data analysis of this, if you see the number one here, uh, these are patients who died. Uh, and you can see that group 2A, group 10, um, and group five uh, continue uh, to go up in these patients, even in these individuals who, who uh, were on a ventilator, it begins to resolve itself. And the red is day zero, the green is day three, and the blue is uh, uh, day seven after entering uh, the intensive care unit. So it was important that only 44 out of 4,776 pro proteins followed this kinetics and, 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 and continue to increase in disease, deceased patients. So how do we prove causality? Well, it, that's difficult. Um, Eli Lilly took a uh, a set of inhibitors uh, through phase 2B clinical trials between 2000 and 2005, um, can we inhibit the catastrophic SPLA2 hyper response uh, in uh, the ARDS multiple organ failure and death? Uh, 
Well, the inhibitor was tried in a, a phase two clinical trial early on in 2003. And if you see in the circle here, it showed really, really good efficacy if it was given within uh, uh, 18 hours of the first organ failure. Um, not so well if it was given later on. In, in a second trial, it was ineffective. But in this trial, uh, the inhibitor was begun within 24 hours of the, of the second organ failure. So we think that the parameters, the stratification parameters that we have developed could be very, very important early on to determine who would need this inhibitor. Again, this is uh, suggested by the, the 90s Lilly trial and, and reduced mortality at that early time point. Again, this was with sepsis and time on uh, ventilators or in the ICU. There is a company, Orphorex, and we're in contact with them, and uh, they're in early stage clinical trials uh, with the SPLA2 uh, uh, inhibitor of uh, uh against uh, COVID, uh, uh, in, initially in a dose ranging trial, and uh, we're working with them with stratification uh, schemes and things. So we're, we're very excited about these trials. Now let me move to long COVID and we don't have data for long COVID, but it's important to understand, I think the uh, kind of the comparisons between the mammalian and the snake venom and understand that uh, what does group 2A or group 2 snake venom do? It certainly hydrolyzes membranes, but it, it really plays havoc at, at neuromuscular um, junctions, both at the neuron and, and the muscle. It, it, it uh, disrupts um, uh, membranes, it binds to receptors, it's taken up and it's moved within cells and, and the mitochondria are destroyed by these uh, SPLA2s. Uh, and again, these are just some of the studies uh, which uh, the biochemistry of SPLA2s and, and, and what they can do, what they can do at neuromuscular junctions, how they're in, internalized, how they're rapidly translocated into the cytosol, how they disrupt and, and shred mitochondria. So it's certainly an attractive candidate uh, as we begin to look at these folks who, who, who were, you know, some marathon runners before post-acute COVID and can't walk to the mailbox now. I, the, the, the dyspnea, the persistent oxygen requirement, uh, knowing its effects on pulmonary surfactant certainly has the ability or certainly has a, to, to play a role if its levels are, are, are maintained high. So we're, we're getting the cohorts, the long COVID cohorts. Um, this is the hypothesis that we are testing now. There are many, many questions that remain. Um, you know, we still are looking at several cohorts, uh, the temporal nature of group 2A and the other isoforms. What are, the, are, what are the other isoforms doing? Uh, um, is it causal or simply associated? Still remains a question. Can we use uh, the uh, stratification theme, uh, stratification uh, in particular SPLA2 levels and BUN levels? Can we use that uh, as a, strat a way to stratify patients who are at high risk of mortality? We're studying utilizing our genetics uh, capabilities to much better understand uh, the genetics of this family of SPLA2s. How's it released? What's it released for? Uh, is it playing a role in post-acute COVID? Uh, what are the circulating levels of those affected? Can we use the same multi-dimensional data and machine learning capabilities for long COVID? Uh, once we can get the cohorts at hand. Are there physiological effects uh, of 
these uh, human group two, um, similar to snake venom at the neuromuscular junctions and would SPLA2 inhibitors be appropriate with stratification as a possible treatment for post-COVID. I'd like to thank my collaborators uh, here at the University of Arizona, uh, Banner, and in particular, uh, uh, Stony Brook, uh, Maurizio Del Potier, uh, and, and, uh, and uh, Karen, you were just heroes uh, in this study, and then, of course, my long-term colleagues at Wake Forest University. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Chilton. That was a very interesting study that I think will spark a lot of questions. Um, as a reminder to our audience, you can submit your questions at any point during the webinar, and we will try to get to as many um, as possible after our next presentation. So with that, let me introduce our next speaker, Dr. Tom Bumal. Dr. Bumal is the Executive Vice President of the Allen Institute, and he is also the Director of the Allen Institute for Immunology in Seattle. Dr. Bumal joined the Allen Institute in 2018 to establish a new research institute dedicated to deep longitudinal profiling of the human immune system in both health and disease to explore new translational hypotheses. Prior to his position at the Allen Institute, Dr. Bumal was a senior vice president of the biotechnology and immunology research component at Lilly Research Laboratories and the site head and president of Lilly's Biotechnology Center of San Diego, which included the former applied molecular evolution subsidiary of Lilly Research Laboratories and early clinical development for the immunology therapeutic area. Over 35 years, his team at Lilly nominated over 100 molecules into clinical development, resulting in eight launch drugs for diabetes, pain, and autoimmunity. It looks like your slides are up and running. So with that, sure. I'm, uh, the stage is yours, Dr. Pimal. Thank you so much for that, uh, inv that the invitation and also the introduction. Um, I'm really here representing a large group of people, as it says on the title slide, and our Fred Hutch partners, which uh, I will talk about. And of course, I want to thank the COVID-19 cohort volunteers that we will talk about their, their data on. Next, please. So just a brief introduction to the Institute. The Allen Institute is 18 years old, and we are almost three years old. We launched in December of 2018, uh, as just stated. Our strategy was not to study preclinical models, but to study the diversity and complexity of humans, both in health and disease. And our goal is not just to describe interesting things, but actually to look for things that could be of use to biopharma, diagnostics, therapeutics, et cetera, going forward. And while our initial studies uh, were in autoimmunity and you know, oncology and immune health, uh, like many during the pandemic about 18 months ago, we we uh, initiated a series of studies uh, in mild to moderate COVID, which I'll talk to you about today. Next, the, the Institute is literally trying to develop, we hope, a world-class, best-in-class, deep immune profiling uh, pipeline on peripheral blood and potentially tissues when available to really understand the immune system in, in unprecedented detail. So if you look at sort of, you know, the fundamental concepts of biology of DNA to mRNA to proteins to cells to tissues to humans. Uh, and minimally, we're trying to use blood, particularly peripheral blood mononuclear cells, looking at each sample through single cell technologies at the open chromatin or at the mRNA transcript levels, at the protein translational level in terms of the proteomics of the plasma, uh, multiple cells of the immune uh, system, a five panel spectral flow cytometry, and then metadata. And the concept is that together uh, will give us a integrated personal immune signature, which can be studied longitudinally, and then allow us to monitor both what happens in normal immune variants, but obviously things that would happen in disease. Next slide. The, the more important thing, as Dr. Chilton just discussed, is that you have to look at this in a completely novel way. So we've built uh, both a cloud computing environment that's highly interactive with our partners, but within there, 
have put the tools to understand how we can look at both vertical and horizontal uh, integration of data streams. We think this is gonna be the future to really explore complex biology and particularly as we get into some of the details about SARS-CoV-2. In the end, our strategy is to discover hypotheses. We wanna validate those and then translate them uh, in, 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 to, to ultimately help patients. Yeah. Next, please. So a couple of comments about sample quality. These highly sensitive tissues are susceptible to artifact is the simplest way to say it. So we've spent a lot of our first two years of the Institute making sure we understood what ground truth was in samples. And since we're working with many groups across the country, um, as an example, uh, single cell RNA and singles and proteomics are highly susceptible to ex vivo uh, time. So all of our collaborations and the one we'll talk about today specifically are looking at blood samples that are prosecuted to PBMCs and frozen within four hours, hopefully within two to three hours of blood draw. Otherwise, a lot of things happen that uh, aren't necessarily uh, representative of the sample uh, from the patient or volunteer. Next slide. So I'm not gonna go into these details today, but since we're a new institute, I'll point you to four or five publications that we've already published uh, that talk about uh, our sample preps, novel integration of technology, detailed protocols recently published, also protocols on our computational biology. And the last one of the examples here is the bioarchive paper that you should definitely look at because in 30, 35 minutes, I will not be able to do the justice of this team's work that I'm gonna give you a snapshot on. Next. So when I put this slide together at the beginning of the month, uh, there were over 244 million cases, greater than 5 million deaths. Um, the focus of our study was not on the severe patients, but the mild to moderate patients, which represents probably at least 80% of infections. And for the most part, these patients mostly get better. To be totally honest with the audience, our initial collaboration sought to map, you know, what was the immune response to the virus and healthy volunteers and, and really understand sort of what goes up must come down and, you know, understand almost in a validation way what our pipeline could illustrate for the acute uh, early infections and mild to moderate cases. None of this would have been possible without a collaboration with Dr. Julie McElrath, who is a world-renowned viral immunologist at the Fred Hutch. And we started that collaboration with her in April of 2020. I wanna introduce her team to you. Next slide. Uh, it's really been awesome to work with experts in the field at the clinical side. And people have worked with vaccines, but also other things. And I just wanna thank them for all the work. And, give you an example of how difficult it was to collect these samples in the beginning in the next two slides. Next, please. At the beginning of the pandemic, as all of us were concerned, uh, it was difficult to get samples and people were concerned about a lot of things, but to the credit of this team, they, they set up literally mobile uh, cohort volunteer clinics last year uh, in parking structures and shopping center parking lots and an amazing way to go into the community, resulting in, in initial uh, volunteers, both infected and exposed of over 470 people. We've now had over a thousand total visits uh, uh, with, uh, with additional blood samples. And our longitudinal studies are planned to go for two to three years. So this is really an exciting, well-documented cohort where we're looking at the evolution of this disease, uh, start to finish and to PASC. Next. So the human metadata that we've collected, particularly in persistent symptoms, were, 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 were very, very inclusive. And on the right, upper right of the slide, a similar slide to Dr. Chilton's, uh, we've obviously begun to, to collect aspects of all the key clinical parameters that people can be documented with, but also looking at personal comments from our volunteers. I included just the cartoon on the upper left because there are a lot of symptoms associated with, with uh, central components and, and performance uh, things that we also collected. And, and we put these all into uh, our assessment of PASC. And just so we're clear, the participants in this study 
uh, were classified as PSC if any symptoms continued from acute illness or related to COVID-19 infection beyond 60 days. Next, please. So the Hutch team, uh, beyond our assays, also established incredible methodologies to understand the complete cellular and humoral immunology to the virus. And uh, I'm pointing out a paper that Dr. Malcolm's team published uh, earlier this year with Rafi Ahmed's group at Emory. Uh, and somebody look at the left-hand side under A, because what typically people like to hear is, oh, we all develop immunity. And that is the dark line uh, in, in, in figure A. But the actual data in the paper, which is a cross-representation of the cohort study I'm going to share with you, shows the massive heterogeneity that we all make in community-acquired infection with almost a two order of magnitude difference between volunteers in terms of neutralizing the antibodies. So it's an interesting concept to consider seriously because we don't measure this kind of activity after infection or quite frankly, literally after getting vaccination, but the heterogeneity of the response, which we'll, we'll play again in our future discussions is something to keep in mind. Next, please. So today's presentation, I'm going to concentrate on a subset that we had multiple time points on a few months ago that included uninfected, so less than 40 years old and greater than 40, uh, a little bit over 20 volunteers, and then also um, healthy volunteers who were infected, uh, who were, again, almost age matched, less than 40 and, and greater than 40. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you'll see a figure that says, what, what did we actually collect from these patients? Many of them had three to five sample time points. Uh, we had the clinical setting uh, information. We had serology, we had the proteomics, the flow cytometry, the cellular immunology to multiple viral components, single cell RNA and single cell taxi. So it's a pretty extensive profiling of patients quite early on from, in, from infection, over, over a few months, uh, which we will highlight today. Next slide, please. So the sampling timeline sh is shown here in, in figure C on the left. And what's interesting is that in the orange and, and blue would be the older and, and younger groups in this. Uh, again, initially we just were collecting these samples, not knowing anything about PASC, but what was interesting in, in this cohort is that five of 18 volunteers developed uh, with the figure eights that you can see in that figure developed the long hauler syndrome. So a reasonably interesting high percentage of our cohort with all of this information collected, including the clinical symptomology that I'll talk about. Just briefly at the far right-hand side of the slide is, is sort of also the WHO scoring systems we're using from mild to moderate to more sick patients as well. So we end up having uh, some, some patients who had extensive uh, symptomologies in terms of, of, of severity. Next, please. So the other aspect that we thought was critical because we saw this in our other studies was that we really need to understand the contributions of age and gender. And so this is sort of backdrop in the cohort. And as you might expect, uh, younger patients and older patients have, have different responses. And we wanted to therefore make sure that we were comparing healthies uh, infected who recovered as well as the long haulers according to some of these parameters. And although this is not surprising, it was just groundwork. The two bullets at the end there, as an example, naive CD4s and CD8s, CD8 T cell uh, memory and, and platelets were higher in young patients CD4 equivalents on the you know, other sides, Tregs and CD16 monocytes, as well as dendritic cells were significantly higher in older patients. So we're trying to take all of these age and gender specific effects into account with some of the discussions we'll have uh, for the rest of the talk. Next, please. The other piece which we wanted to understand is, did we see uh, both normal responses to viruses and did we see what would be expected cellular immunology you'd expect with an acute viral infection. This is analysis that Arthi Tala did in our group uh, in which she looked specifically at plas B cell plasma blasts uh, over the course of multiple time points and then did pseudotime analysis uh, 
to understand what we would see from these deep profiling methodology, both at the RNA level as well as other methodology. And without going into the details here, uh, the punchline is at the bottom is that patients in early days since symptom onset have plasma blasts that show high cell cycling, higher cell proportions. And of course, this was an expected outcome to an acute infection, but it was important to have this to visualize what we're going to talk about in multidimensional analysis going forward. Next slide, please. So what about the viral response uh, in this cohort? And essentially in, in figure E, F, and G here, you see some of the results from our Hutch colleagues in which we documented both the T cell responses as well as the antibody responses, both for the receptor binding domain and neutralizing antibody, as well as op opportunities to begin to look at spike specific memory cells uh, in both groups. And basically all of the cohorts seem to react somewhat. There were a few patients that responded a little higher here and there, but in general, we saw a very good immune response uh, in, in these groups to, to the virus. Next slide. When we looked at, next, uh, that's good, thank you. Uh, we looked at also aspects of, of the acute mild infection at the lymphocyte level by flow cytometry, at the proteomic level by O-link proteomics, and then some of the attack seek data. We also noted that we saw great T cell and B cell activation, but as we mentioned earlier, the age enhancements of interferon signaling were apparent. If you look specifically at figure D, where we compare uh, uh, the groups there, you can see in the first part of the triangle, lower middle, you know, kind of, you know, the uninfected and then the infected, the, young, the younger COVID patients and the older COVID patients. There were some dramatic changes. We're selecting the biggest differences here among uh, a few thousand transcripts, but really amazing you know, on those differences. But so when we look at this collectively, you know, everyone has is, is got a bit of a unique signature to the virus, but we can see some clear age pieces. And this is going to come back because we're going to end up talking a little bit more about uh, a few of these signaling pathways, the implications for PSC. Next slide, please. Another important thing is once you get the infection, what's your path back to normalcy? And, and this was something we were doing in any event because we wanted to understand sort of the up of the immune system and the resolution of the immune system and then the memory. And these are just a few figures from the, from the preprint and bioarchives, which talk about you know, this, this path, again, looking at multiple parameters, the flow cytometry, the proteomics, the single cell RNA, and then trying to integrate this into a pathway analysis to ask, well, how did the path really work? And I'll show two more slides that are a little bit easier to look at visually, taking into account all of these interesting single cell multiomic parameters. Next slide, please. So when you, when you look at uh, figure F specifically, just looking at the proteome, good to visualize here, the black dots uh, and the green dots represent the, um, the black being COVID positive, the green being the uninfected controls. And at the top there, you can see at the beginning how disparate and different they are when you have an acute infection. But after five or six visits, you can see the clusters begin to come together. Similarly, we saw this in other analyses uh, in multiple parameters, but what was fascinating is that if you looked at this and you broke this apart, next slide please, uh, is that a little easier to see this visually in, at the upper left, these would be the uninfected. We've added the infected in the second parameter there and then trace their sort of over time, visit one to two, visit two to three, three to four, four to five. You know, how did patients map back? And what came up was that there were a few patients that never mapped back to what would be considered uh, a homeostatic or normal response. And as we started to map metadata back to the immune systems, we, sh we could show that underlying conditions often map to some of these slow paths to normal homeostasis. And that was kind of intriguing to us at the very beginning because we were starting to see 
uh, at this time, you know, people also talking about persistent symptoms and, of course, the role of underlying conditions and morbidity and mortality in the case. Next slide, please. So as we dug a little deeper, you know, what we saw was that there were some really fascinating opportunities to actually say what's still on, what turned off. And because most of us are, as immunologists are trained in activation phases versus resolution phases, we, we initially looked at what were some of the persistent immune activation states in our cohort uh, compared to infections from recovered patients. And as I've mentioned earlier, you know, some of the viral components are really not changing. But what was intriguing to us, and this is shown in figure B on this slide, is that uh, looking at RNA signaling pathways, is that the interferon response pathways were persistently elevated. Uh, this has been described by others, and others have also mentioned this. We've also saw IL-1 beta signaling pathways as well as toll-like receptor pathways that persistently stayed positive. So this was very intriguing to us, and that caused us to dive a little deeper into some of this biology. Next slide. We also saw that the serum proteome had many, many features <laughs> that were elevated uh, in figure C in this volcano plot on the right-hand side of that plot. Then looking at the attack seek, we saw that a lot of the changes from people who've recovered versus people who were persisting were specifically uh, in figure D in the green on, on the left-hand side of the plot. In the, in the dendritic cells and the monocytes where there was just a lot of transcriptional changes that were unique to persistence versus, versus people who resolved. And that led us to building some more hypotheses on what are some of those target genes, specifically in monocytes and other cell types that would be potentially responsible for these persistent symptoms. Next slide, please. On route to that analysis, we said, well, did it matter if it compared it to the antibody uh, response from this acute early phase across the cohort? And the bottom line is that there are unique signatures associated with better and less antibody responses, but we really didn't see in this segment of the analysis something that correlated with persistence. Next slide, please. But when we started to look at the proteome, broadly speaking, and again, all link measuring over 1,300 proteins, and then mapping specifically the changes uh, compared to people who are uninfected, which is the first rectangle uh, in figure A here in this slide. Uh, most, of the, most of the intensity here is very low, and as you can see, it's largely a purple and black slide over many, many features. These are uh, but then when we went to the COVID positive but recovered, the middle triangle, you can see that there's this significant elevation of number of features, as we discussed earlier, uh, at the proteome, the cellular level, as part of the response to the virus. But as time continued, uh, we see this decrease in the, the persistence of some of these elevated features and more of the purple looking black like phenomena seen in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the normals. What intrigued us in this analysis, however, was the, the, the few PSC patients we had who had these persistent turned on um, pathways. And so uh, Sue Svesaker in the group inferred some of the more important ligands that he could see in these persistent features seen in our actual volunteers and started to build an interaction map to predict where would these ligands potentially go and which cell types could be the receiver and what would be after the binding to predict it pathway. So this was a bit of an integration analysis to understand what pathways may be really activated uh, in the PSC versus healthies and convalesced normals. Next slide, please. So this was a very exciting set of observations and I'm only gonna give you literally uh, what I would suggest the tip of the iceberg 
because this is clearly something that's ongoing, that's going to require a lot more validation. But it's exciting enough to share with you some initial observations that we think are, are very, very potentially important and intriguing as we think about the syndrome. So in figure C here, we're the top 10 inferred ligands from our study comparing infections to convalescence. And as you can see, there's some pretty interesting molecules in there. Uh, some have been described by others. We discuss interferon. Um, we've also talked about IL-12, TNF. But th there's some other molecules that you know really need some further study, including TGF beta-1 as a potential ligand with significant both cell type receiver activity uh, associated with that ligand being overexpressed. Figure D is just percent of the ligands actually activating what we hope would be target gene networks uh, downstream of those, uh, those receptors for those ligands. And sure enough, we saw enrichment in STAT1 and uh, NF-kappa B and, and other pathways here that, that are truly interesting signatures of persistent uh, inflammation. If you then classify some of these changes in figure E versus early acute infection versus longitudinal infection versus these PSC, we did see some unique features highlighted associated with PSC. And there are many things here and, and time doesn't allow us to go into some of the interesting, uh, many interesting opportunities, but I'm just gonna illustrate uh, three here from panel F and panel G. I've starred uh, uh, in, in panel F, just the interesting comparison between early acute longitudinal and PSC on interferon alone. I mean, it's pretty stark, almost stage specific persistent activation. But I would also point to the very bottom of figure F where there are multiple molecules that are extremely intense in PSC uh, and, and lighter or non-existent in controls. So there are many opportunities here. We are essentially you know, having to go by these one at a time and do that kind of careful validation work, some might call slogging to figure out what are the key mediators that, that drive this persistence. And then similarly, when we look at the aspects of, of panel G, and then if you're really clear on what things might be specific pathways that are persisting in our, in our uh, patient volunteers, you know, we clearly can find some of those. That's also seen in the oval. So this is, this is detective work, uh, but we have these massively complex data sets and we're starting to, to tease out some really important uh, ideas here worth further validation uh, uh, and hypotheses that could be drivers of persistence. Uh, of these inflammatory states seen in these patients. Next slide, please. So this has actually led to us uh, to work with our partners at the Fred Hutch to dramatically increase our PSC patients. Sadly, it is not hard to find additional PSC patients. And, uh, and, and additional controls and additional uneffecteds. And here are some preliminary data that we've just created recently, again, just showing the proteomics for lack of time. But long story short, we do see as we expand the cohort, uh, a number of persistent signatures, of persistent inflammatory signatures. And, and in this proteomic survey, uh, survey uh, you know, we believe that it's a bit heterogeneous, uh, but important for us to sort of go through this uh, pathways, these pathways very specifically, and they're they're varied, but persistent, consistent inflammatory signatures seen in PSC. So this is the the hard part. We've described or discovered some of these interesting observations. We think they're worth further study. And so working with our collaborators, and if any of you in the audience are interested in any of these pathways, please please ping us afterwards or ask some questions because this is going to be a lot of work to sort of dissect what is the real driver driver or, or, or subsets of these conditions that might explain some of these persistent uh, 
uh, things. And then persistent signatures, but linking them again to the, the pathophysiology of, of our patients. So we're committed to following through with this and now are mapping detailed symptoms to signatures uh, along with uh, additional in vitro assays to, to validate and hopefully unravel this complex syndrome. Give you a couple of examples in closing before a few acknowledgements and, and then discussion time with questions. Next slide, please. So, so shown here, uh, are two interesting examples of what we've tried to do. And in, in, in figure A, we've, we've looked at, okay, we've got this great information from transcriptomics, flow cytometry to actually identify the cell, single cell types that are having unique features, right? So we can look at the whole immune system uh, with the exception of, of the myeloid component we lose in Cyclohypic separated cells, and then literally go line by line and begin to ask, well, what do we think will be important here? And for many reasons, we've concentrated on uh, a few of the key pathways that we knew were, were interesting in driving uh, persistent inflammation seen in autoimmunity, but also in other, other syndromes and diseases. And so shown here, you know, is the sort of menu on the left, and then some of the examples we've looked at specifically looking at the changes that we would see uh, uh, at, at, at specific, uh, at specific uh, related pathways related to ligands. And it's actually pretty, pretty, it's going to be a lot of fun, a lot of hard work, but there are many features that, that change. And some of the changes are not exactly, you know, mind-blowing. They're real, but the changes are perhaps subtle, but subtle in, in the context of a complex signature. So we would offer today for, for discussion that these signatures need to be looked at, not just in your favorite molecule or your favorite target, your favorite cell, your favorite enzyme, but actually in the context of a symptom, uh, of a system related to the symptoms. And I think this is gonna be, you know, part of our future work to testable hypotheses and hopefully some more resolutions uh, opportunities for these long hauler syndromes. And one more slide just to illustrate some of the things that we're focusing next uh, on uh, in the upcoming work. Um, and, and this will be something that we'll, we'll try to leave you with. Uh, we wanna say that there are stable protein differences you know, from the cytokine storm, the activation phase that persist. Not all of them are extensively high, but I point out in this example from the RNA, the persistently high TNF signaling seen in the immune system. But probably just as important, but sometimes overlooked without these abilities to look at longitudinal studies, is that early on, there has been low but real chronic innate signaling and we talked about the interference signaling, but also here I've shown you the rig-like receptor signaling, a sort of a DNA sensing signaling, another key innate signaling pathway, danger signal recognition pathway, that's always firing through these syndromes. So you've got the classical bad actors in inflammation like TNF. You've got interesting ones like interferon, which are key in innate responses. But more importantly, you have many other sensing mechanisms, which make you wonder why would these systems be persisting? You know, why didn't they resolve? Interestingly, that's just, again, the tip of the iceberg, because as I mentioned earlier, if you looked at in this case, the open chromosome persistent transcriptional factor activation in just the innate cells, greater than 30 days, greater than 60 days, uh, you can see on this curve on the right under single cell taxi that the red in particular um, is, is dominated in terms of these persistent activation phases documented by single cell ataxy in both the dendritic cells and the CD14 cells. So we would like to suggest that, that stable protein differences could drive uh, innate immune-centric hyperinflammation, but in conjunction with both the innate side and the adaptive side going forward. Next slide, please. So in summary, we think this is a really exciting approach to 
profiling uh, samples from humans longitudinally. We can see the heterogeneous innate and adaptive responses, but also the heterogeneous resolution phase, which we're really excited about because that's a field that's been a bit overlooked and may play a role in the PSC. And when we map human metadata and symptomology with the multiomics, we can see that these clear pathways that persist, and we think they're also associated and could be pathologically associated with long COVID or past beyond the normal resolution. Watching the duration, sort of dissecting the underlying, me underlying mechanisms will help us uh, uh, sort of validate that going forward. And validation and more biology is necessary. We're just at the beginning of this. So we're looking at cohorts now, and we're looking at strategies and pathway cell types, but also trying to expand this and, and others who may have alternative technologies or alternative cohorts are, please, uh, as I mentioned earlier, please, please connect with us and see if there are opportunities for us to collaborate. We all should be working on this problem. It's, it's a mounting global crisis uh, across the planet. A couple of acknowledgements, next slide. I have to thank my, my incredible team at the Elm Institute. Uh, we've all just been here a few years. They've bonded together. In the third column, I have three people with stars around their name in a little green box, Arthi Tala, Greg Zidas, and Sue Hospisaker. They are the massive workhorses behind most of the data that we created here, along with the teams that built the pipelines and all the assays and all the analysis. But I, don't, I wanted to highlight them specifically. And just a plug, we're a young institute and we are still recruiting. If any of you or any of your students have interest in work like this, uh, we're gonna re be recruiting another 20 people in the next 12 months. So uh, keep us in mind if you're thinking about job opportunities. And finally, my last slide, uh, I have to thank our founder, uh, Paul Allen, a visionary philanthropist. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he started the Allen Institute with us, but uh, he succumbed in 2018. So we do dedicate our work to him. And I want to thank his sister, uh, Jody Allen, who provided additional funding uh, for these projects to allow us to do these studies and share them with you today through the Paul G. Allen Family Foundation. Thank you for your attention. Wonderful, thank you so much, Dr. Mirbal. Um, the audience has already submitted several questions, so we can uh, dive right into our Q&A session. And maybe I'll start us off with, with the first question for you, Dr. Bimal. Um, could I ask you to speculate what you think is driving the development of PASC in these patients? You've shown us a lot of different signals, but what do you think is really going on? Well, this is pure speculation, but I, I do think uh, as an immunologist, I'll be biased. I mean, I think there's something in our epi phenomena, our epigenetics uh, as humans, uh, young humans, older humans, that you know predispose us for unique responses to infections and predisposes us for unique opportunities to develop uh, diseases with too much immunity and too little immunity. Uh, I, I'm beginning to think that there could be an interesting connection between autoimmunity, autoinflammatory disease, and, and what pathogens do oftentimes, particularly overwhelming infections, in, in really enhancing or potentially even breaking tolerance in normal humans, because you've gotten a massive signal to, to resolve. And, and maybe in a few of us, that, that signal doesn't resolve. And maybe that's why we see persistent uh, uh, long COVID. Thank you. Um, uh, as a follow-up question, you you talked about um, how SARS-CoV-2 can um, induce interferon gamma signaling. Do you have any um, uh, data or, or knowledge of the mechanisms by which the virus um, does that? Well, you'd ex actually expect that to be a response to, to a virus. Uh, as I mentioned, the innate immune system is is going to respond to danger signals and danger signals are are capsid proteins or bacterial coat proteins things that just aren't self and so and and we have dna and rna and related to this so the, the the interference system is really part of that that you know kind of host defense immune defense mechanism so that's expected i think what's unique about the observations we're seeing is that in a subset of humans who get 
get the virus, there are persistent interference signatures. And by the way, that's also interesting because in some autoimmune diseases, particularly diseases like lupus, there are persistent interference signatures. So again, back to the parallels to immune dysfunction in long COVID, I think we can take some lessons from other fields to understand if they're if those parallels are coincidental or actually mechanistically linked. Thank you. We actually had a, a related question to that um, that was asking whether you had compared any of your data to um, uh, to patients who had been diagnosed with uh, ME and CFS uh, prior to COVID. I didn't hear the last part of the question. Oh, that. sorry. Um, uh, if you had any data um, uh, that would compare the um, uh, sorry, I lost my question here. Um, if you had any data that would compare to patients who had previously been diagnosed with ME and CFS or uh, chronic fatigue syndrome before uh, COVID? Yeah. That's a great question, but I do not have that data. I wish I did. Uh, I think uh, it does spark a, another comment because as we've talked with infectious disease experts, there are a couple of other infectious disease examples where people have persistent symptoms and maybe there's something to learn there too, like Epstein-Barr virus, but also uh, Lyme disease, uh, which has some persistent symptoms with many similarities. So I think it's a really excellent question to understand and dive a little deeper because these, those are also the ones mentioned by the question are also really important to understand. Thank you. A uh, question for Dr. Chilton now. Um, is the PLA2 signature that you described, is that unique to SARS-CoV-2 or has it been seen in other viral responses too? You mentioned something about sepsis, but has it been seen in others as well? I, I, we don't, I don't feel that this is a, uh, a COVID-19 specific uh, response. I, I think, uh, you know, one of the things about our study that that I think it kind of in, in kind of changes the way that we think about how we do studies, and and I, I think uh, the beautiful talk that has just been given uh, speaks to this. I I, I, uh, I, I think in, in our case uh, it was the lipidomics and machine learning that led us to the hypothesis and 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 the hypothesis that as in this case group 2 secretory pla2 was elevated but but do i think that is a unique um, a unique response uh, no i think the literature says in ards in septic shock in in, in and um, these very high levels of this are elevated. And, and, and indeed, those initial studies in the late 1980s, early 1990s uh, identified, they didn't know the isoforms of secretory PLA2 at the time, but they identified uh, these elevating in septic shock and, 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 and increasing in their elevations uh, when the folks died and, 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 and resolved when they did not. Again, there are many, many other things that can do that, but, but I think um, uh, Orphorex, the company uh, the, the, that's using this inhibitor for, for snake bites, uh, uh, I, I think there are many, uh, many situations where, where, where this enzyme is elevated in, and is causing damage, and and so so, um, yeah, yes, I, I I don't think it's specific to to COVID nineteen. Thank you. Um, have you have you by any chance um, looked at whether PLA two levels fluctuate during the various stages of the disease? You know, we're we're working with folks. We're uh, working with folks at the Gates Foundation now, and and. Uh, Dr. Brommel's talk was so beautiful because he has the temporal data, and the temporal data is magical. Um, and 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 that's why it's very very hard to get access to that data. So we're working with the Gates Foundation and several groups that they have funded to to, to 
uh, in particular, get the temporal proteomic and metabolomic data. We, we too, are very interested in, in the multi-omic uh, approach and, and, and putting forth the hypotheses. But uh, uh, we, as of yet, have, well, I won't say that uh, the Mass General Hospital data that was available was proteomic data with three different temporal time points, but it really is vitally important for us to be able to temporally look at uh, at, at these responses, and, and that's difficult to do and difficult to get your hands on. Right. I, I guess that's a perfect segue back to uh, uh, Dr. Bumal to see whether um, you have actually seen PLA2 uh, in your studies, in your serum proteome analyses. Oops. Um, you know, I'll have to go back and look at that because uh, it probably didn't pop up in our top elevated um, elevated components. Uh, and and I, I guess I don't actually know the answer, but, you know, we tried to look for those that were even mildly elevated over time. And we'll have to go back and see if, if that did pop. I, having worked at Eli, Eli Lilly, I'm very familiar with the SPLA2 program uh, there uh, and also was working in sepsis and M MODS uh, with another coagulation enzyme uh, complex states. So yeah, it's something I'll have to revisit. Thank you. Um, and someone also noticed that the Alzheimer linked molecule APP um, also came out of your IPA analysis as one of the top signals. Could you comment on what you think it's doing there? <laughs> or I mean, not there, but in, in PASC, I guess. Yeah, you know, it, it's it's really a lot of fun to dive into what we know about each component, whether it's an RNA or a transcription factor. Um, and and I would I would submit that I think we're getting a better handle on flow cytometry and 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 RNA and proteomics. Uh, when we get to the level of the transcriptional regulation of human cells. Uh, I think we're 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 earlier days than the rest, but but the idea of integrating them would be great. And, you know, for us, I, I just, we just, we've shown you what we know so far in terms of the, as an immunology institute, focusing on the immune system. I personally have a great interest in neurodegeneration, having worked in that area in my, in my past career. And, and I do think there's an important observation that we cannot ignore on the connection of the symptomology associated with uh, central component symptomology in PSC in the immune system. And, and now even uh, some clinical evidence that SSRIs and other, uh, other, met, uh, other strategies, which you would not think connect to this, have connected and have reduced morbidity and mortality in, in, in this infection. And this sort of neuroimmune access is something we're going to have to think about. But specifically, uh, a comment on that target, I, I do not have any more information. Okay, thank you. Um, is there any evidence that ongoing treatment with TNF inhibitors for autoimmune disease affects the likelihood of developing long COVID that you know of? I'm, I'm unaware of that data. Um, in, in fact, if anything, uh, there are there have been experiments to actually use IL-6 modulators and uh, JAK-1, JAK-2 inhibitors that inhibit the signaling of multiple cytokines like, like uh, baricitinib uh, and others. And actually there is some efficacy in, in severe disease where you can uh, knock down some of these, these uh, cytokine signaling pathways and so-called cytokine storm syndromes but, uh, you know, I, I, I don't have a direct, maybe someone does, but I just don't know the answer to that question. Good question. <laughs> Dr. Chilton, do you have anything to add by any chance? Uh, no, I, 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 I don't. That, they... That's all right. That's all right. I'll, uh, I have a, a, my next question is for you. Um, uh, based on your data, it looks like higher level of higher levels of SPLA2 would predict a more detrimental outcome of COVID-19. Do you think it's possible to use this as a biomarker 
to predict severe COVID development? I, I think it is, and, and, and I guess perhaps the most, or the, I, the, and again, I feel a little humbled by talking about the early Lilly studies because I, I know Dr. Buma was part of those studies. But I, I, I you know, I, I think the stratification of the patients, uh, I mean, clearly, you know, it, it does not appear that SPLA2 is, 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 you know, is playing a role in the lethality for everyone. But, but, but certainly when we take, you know, circulating SPLA2 levels together with blood urinary nitrogen and we put those two together, I think we have a very important potential stratification um, strategy uh, that, that could predict who, which the patients in which those inhibitors might work well. And so, so while the inhibitors might be used for, 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 you know, in low resource areas for anyone, I think in clinical trials, I think the stratification uh, uh, could, could certainly help with the possibility of success. And I, 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 that would, would be certainly something that I would certainly encourage as, as we move forward to, to revisit these inhibitors. Thank you. Um, there are still quite a few good questions in, in our uh, Q&A box, but I think we have time for only one more question, um, and that is one for Dr. Bumal. Um, as you look at, at your data, do you think there is a strong correlation between PAC and uh, quantifiable lack of overall health in susceptible populations that could account for uh, the portion of infected in individuals who have more severe cases of COVID? Yeah, I, I, we're just starting to look at those kinds of questions, so I don't have a, a good answer specifically. Uh, but I, I do think, uh, just to, to, to comment briefly, uh, I our cohort is largely volunteers in the Seattle Tacoma or uh, area, as I mentioned. Uh, and I think the really important question that we have to ask now is, is beyond first responders and volunteers who are very health conscious, you know, we need to look at underserved populations deliberately. Uh, and it's something we're discussing now with groups. Uh, we also need to look at the extremes beyond the scope of our study, uh, potentially including younger um, younger children and, and pediatric patients. And we're starting to do that in normals, as well as the other extremes on the other side where a lot of the morbidity and mortality side. But I think the secret is to map whatever humans you decide to study is to map the underlying conditions, their health, uh, uh, documentation of their health over the last few years, related to the outcomes because the comorbidities associated with, with the swing different outcomes, I think are, are, are embedded in some of that information. Thank you so much. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have for today. Um, if you have any further questions or um, if you would like to reach out to the speakers um, about any um, other Sorry, I totally lost my turn of thought. If, if you have any questions or comments that you would like to um, reach out to the speakers for, you can see their uh, email addresses uh, shown on the screen right now. As a reminder, our webinar will be archived on the Scientist website and you will receive an email notifying you when the on-demand webinar is available. I would like to thank every one of you who took the time to join us today and particularly those of you who shared your questions and comments. On behalf of the scientists, I would also like to thank our speakers, Dr. Steve Chilton and Dr. Tom Bumal, as well as our sponsor, Cayman Chemical. Thanks everyone for tuning in and hope to see you again next time. Have a wonderful day.